You follow the course on ecological and environmental modeling. Before jumping on our computer, we need to reflect first on what models are and why we actually engage in modeling. Models are a simple representation of a complex phenomena. They are an abstraction of reality and therefore do not contain all the features of the real system. The model on the left represents, for instance, our idealized view on how we would like to look like. But obviously, Ms. Jones is lacking any connection to reality as she lacks signs of sleep shortage or stress. The globe, atomic and rocket models on the right are scale models that represent either macroscopic or microscopic elements, but they clearly lack the underlying mechanics or energetic processes that make them function as in reality. Finally, the map below is a reflection of the location of roads, cities and water bodies, but irrelevant details such as individual houses are ignored. All these models therefore comprise all the characteristics of a real world, but do only include features that are essential to the problem to be solved or described. Models are the simple, idealized representations of a complex phenomenon. All models are thus simpler than the real world, and in a form that can be easily understood and interpreted. They typically serve a purpose. Maps, for instance, are very useful to drivers. They focus only on the objects of interest and ignore irrelevant details and are developed at a temporal and spatial scale of interest. Scientific models are built within this framework as well. They are used as a simple representation of complex ecological and environmental phenomena, which we can never capture inclusively. Because of their simplification of reality, they are useful to generate theoretical insights into the functioning of systems. They allow generalizations and they can eventually be used for forecasting and management. The development of theory is an essential step in science. It allows us to generate hypotheses to be tested in empirical research and to properly design experiments. Think, for instance, of generating a solid understanding of deep sea productivity. Importantly, if the developed theory cannot reproduce patterns as observed in nature, we can learn from it and study apparently missing processes that may eventually change our conceptual understanding of how the system is working. From a more applied side, models also allow for interpolation and the quantification of important processes and process rates that are difficult or way too expensive to measure. They also allow predictions of certain management actions in advance of effectively taking actions. Models, for instance, may help to predict the outflow concentrations of certain pollutants from lakes after some upstream pollution by dumping or leaking. Scientific models always have in common that they rely on logics and that they are expressed into a common language of mathematics. These mathematical models allow predictions when they are parameterized with data. In many cases, they are solved by the use of computational methods. Translating your conceptual model into a mathematical form will in all cases force you to think very rigorously. And remember, the aim of this course is to make you appreciate, or rather re-appreciate, the power of mathematics to understand and solve complex problems in biology and environmental sciences. We typically separate two types of mathematical models. First, statistical modeling. This is all well known by you, and it's essentially correlating observed data with some predictions based on their expected distribution. They are thus descriptive and only relevant to the domain where the data were collected. We can consequently consider them as so-called black box models, as they do not rely on any causal or mechanistic understanding of the processes that underlie the statistical relationships. Statistical models contrast with process-based or mechanistic models that are built on knowledge of a specific system. Such models include all the relevant processes and allow us insights into the specific drivers of a certain system. So while statistical models can be seen as analogous to perfectly working watches to know the time, mechanistic models allow insights into the clockwork as well. These mechanistic models are the focus of this course. Evidently, we will develop them to understand the role of organismal interactions with their environment and back. We will teach you during the first six weeks how to develop so-called flux-based models, 
So models that deal with exchange of energy, momentum, mass, or individuals between separate compartments. The latter may involve, for instance, energy transfer from air to water, the transfer of movement from air to the sea, transfer of elementary nutrients among organisms or between different parts of ecosystems, or the exchange of individuals between populations, trophic levels or even phenotypic states. For instance, to make this more concrete, you will learn to develop simple ecosystem models that represent feeding relationships between trophic levels in the oceans, and to couple these fluxes of nutrients to changes in their availability within the water column, also in relation to forcing factors like climate. Typically, as models need to remain as simple as possible, many details will be ignored. If the model is developed to understand, for instance, nitrogen fluxes, abstraction will be made of all different species of algae, herbivore fish, plankton, and predators.